that if you don't always get the messaging that you can be good at math or that you are good at math, that might not be part of your identity just yet. I never uh, really thought that I could be a scientist or an engineer. And um, I knew that I needed to have different jobs to help support me and pay for college. And so I was a soccer coach, which I loved. Um, I coached little girls. I played field hockey at the same time. I was a walk-on in field hockey. And um, I started doing research. And that research really helped me understand that there was a method and a process to problem solving that I really enjoyed. I also uh, taught myself how to code. And so at the time, this was in the 90s when the websites were just coming out. So it was first generation websites. And I thought, I can learn how to do this. So I taught myself how to code. And I had a job with different departments were hire me. And so I would build different websites for different departments on campus. When I got recruited to work at Berkeley, um, it was really exciting because Berkeley is such a prestigious campus, but I also realized that for a lot of students that were here, the access to information and how to get into programs and tutoring and how to go on to graduate school was there was just so much hidden curriculum that it was hard for people to understand and hard for students to understand how to navigate all of that effectively. I, I found out that um, I had to face, after having um, just had a child within a year, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I, I knew that that was a, a big journey in front of me, but I also didn't realize how many surgeries and chemotherapy, you know, all the treatments and everything that would involve. So as I was going through chemotherapy, um, and I live in Davis and work at Berkeley, I wasn't able to connect with my students in the way that I wanted to. So I started having these small micro touches by talking with them via, at the time, Skype, and um, texting a lot. And what I found is that those micro uh, touches were really powerful and that kind of got me thinking about well how, how are we showing up in digital spaces to provide access to students because it's not necessarily about the quantity it's about the quality of, of those touches so the work that I started to do ended up being related to technology and my research sort of evolved to create techno inclusion so I created a theory of techno inclusion um, which is focusing on um, digital spaces human behavior and equity and inclusion practices so I was really interested in understanding how you could use technology um, through equity and inclusion practices to create validating spaces, uh, a welcoming organizational culture, or for us on campus, campus climate, um, and also a sense of belonging for students that would give them access to not only um, networks, but information and opportunities and activities. And so in, in thinking about how I was doing that and, and going through um, you know, the experience of, of battling cancer, you know, and having to advocate as a disabled person, uh, thinking through all of that kind of came together in this nice vision of that techno inclusion matters and how we show up in digital spaces to student matters because often that's one of the first places that they start when they're starting to research a particular faculty, class, campus, for example. The way that we communicate now, our information seeking practices are completely different than they were maybe 15 years ago. So we are creating um, amplified students, right? They're, they're technologically amplified in a way where they have access to information 24 seven. They're not waiting to go uh, to a classroom necessarily to learn. So how are we connecting with them to help them on that journey?